Robert Durst is the son of an American real estate magnate and the subject of Andrew Jarecki's HBO docuseries, The Jinx. Robert was accused of killing three people over the course of his life. His first wife, his best friend, and his neighbor. Buckle up for this one, because we're about to go on a wild ride. Pinch poke, you owe me a coke. It's time to talk about The Jinx, today on Death in Entertainment. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. <laughs> what do you call this thing anyway? Death in entertainment. Greetings, Deto Universe. How are ya? What's going on, everybody? How is it going this week? My name is Kyle Plouffe. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. And today, Pinch Poke, you owe me a Coke. We're talking about the Jinx, baby! It's back. <laughs> and it's jinxier than ever. <laughs> the Jinx is back. Uh, yeah, this is a crazy, terrifying story of this piece of work. And somewhat funny. Somewhat funny, yeah. Because he's such a buffoon. Uh, yeah. Robert Durst. No relation to Fred Durst, unfortunately. Or fortunately. <laughs> Just a reminder that this is a true crime comedy podcast, so if you're not looking to have a few laughs, this might not be for you. If you don't think funerals are hilarious, yeah. <laughs> go find another spot to hang out at. Be on your way! <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to be on our way to the story. Ooh. Okay, Mr. Robert Durst. He was born on April 12th, 1943 in New York City. Oh, New York City? New York City! <laughs> yes, New York City. Uh, A rare non-Wisconsin, non-Massachusetts. I know, right? <laughs> he was raised in Scarsdale, New York, which is just north of the city. It's very small, actually. There's only like 8,000 people that are there. Hmm. Income for a family is $291,542. Ah. Yeah. So that is what they call an affluent community. Yes. Affluenza is breaking out over there. 84% white, 12% Asian, 2% Latino, 1% black. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that <laughs> is white with a capital <laughs> H. <laughs> White. If Scarsdale sounds familiar to you, in Seinfeld, Kramer is accidentally awarded with a Tony Award for the fictional musical Scarsdale Surprise. Okay. Supposedly based on the Scarsdale diet doctor murder. <laughs> wow. So that was sort of predicting things to come. Yeah, back to murder. Bum, bum, bum. And on the show Friends, another NBC big show, Ross tells Rachel that he wants to plan for their future and mentions he wishes to raise their future children with her in Scarsdale. Oh. So, you know, it's a very well-to-do, sought-after community um, for at least the white people, fake white people on NBC as well. So on NBC <laughs> must-see TV shows, it was used as a reference for a nice place to retire. Exactly, yes. So Robert, he is the eldest son of Seymour Durst. I don't know if I want to see much more of these Durst. want to see less Durst over here. Robert's grandfather was a successful real estate developer who founded the Durst Organization in 1927. So he was, you know, managing properties and then started buying them himself and just went on a tear, became a multimillionaire. Perfect timing. Yeah. Where he's probably getting those properties cheap and... 27, right before the Great Depression. And uh, there are people who tried to get into real estate right around this time that sunk. And the fact that he actually made it out is pretty impressive, to be honest. Yeah. Sunk like the Titanic at that time. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, property... Uh, Values went up in New York. Eventually, yeah. <laughs> when Robert was seven years old, 
seven years old, just a, a wee boy. Mm-hmm. He witnessed, or he says he witnessed, his mother commit suicide by jumping off the roof of the family home in Scarsdale. He claimed his father woke him up and brought him to the window to watch while his mother was standing there and then jumped off. So his dad made him watch his mom fall to her death. That's what Robert says. Or jump to her death, I guess. Like the omen, that scene in the omen. Yeah. It's all for you, Damien. Yeah. What a disturbing thing to see. It's all for you. <laughs> for a seven-year-old, too. Yeah. I mean, we're That's gonna... interesting because if you watch the Up series, the documentary series where it follows kids every seven years as they turn into adults and eventually old people. Yeah. <laughs> they say that. See a child at seven and you'll see the man mm. who they will become. And so if Robert Durst is dealing with all this tragedy, perhaps he just stayed a tragic figure. It's possible. That's the beginning of it. Yeah. Uh, some people are just bad seeds, just like Damien. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Because you well, think getting possessed by Satan is the <laughs> bad <laughs> makes you a bad seed? Yes, a bad act. Yeah, <laughs> a bad actor. I think we're gonna find out that he's a very unreliable narrator, and he looks out for himself, and also likes to put himself in precarious situations. Let's just say, because I'm sure his father uh, refutes that claim. Well, his brother Doug definitely refutes it. He says he's full of shit, and he didn't see his mother jump off the house. Uh, and their father definitely did not wake him up and bring him to the window to watch. But his mother did jump off the house. Yes. I could see a child making up that story and they had her pretending that they saw it. Like somehow it feels like he did see it in some ways. Daddy brought me to the window. Well, you know what I mean? Like as an adult, like it's all fuzzy at some point. Like yeah. Just a big, you know, pile of tragedy. And, and- it's a better story. Because I don't think he cares that his mother died. Maybe he does, but... No, I guess what I was saying more is perhaps he thinks he saw it. Mm. I'm just doing devil's advocate here. It's possible you're doing Robert's advocate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Robert and Doug have always hated each other. Doug's the younger brother. Robert's the eldest. So in Robert's head, he was be- going to be taking over the Durst organization when his father retired. Doug had his shit together. And even though he's the younger brother, Seymour... Their father had picked Doug to run the company for him when he retired. Mm. And that drove Robert crazy because he hated the development and real estate, all of that stuff. But he wanted the money. So he was going to run it just because of the money? Oh, yeah. So that's a huge insult that it would go to the younger brother. Yeah, but he had no intentions of like really running the company. He just wanted the clout that came with his father bestowing this upon him. Or skills to run it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not at all. In 1953, a therapist diagnosed Robert with, quote, personality decomposition and possibly schizophrenia. Very official. (laughs) Possibly. (laughs) Durst was labeled a loner by classmates, and he ended up going to Scarsdale High, graduated, went to Lehigh University, graduated with an economics degree in 1965. He went on to try. He came to good old sunny Los Angeles, Mm. tried to get a doctoral degree at UCLA, and he ended up meeting a lifelong friend, Susan Berman out here at UCLA, and he ended up dropping out and moving back to New York City. New York City? New York City! 1971. He's palling around, traipsing around New York City, daddy's little boy, going in and out of apartment buildings that his dad owns, and he sees this girl that is just absolutely beautiful that lives in one of the buildings that his dad owns. Name's Kathy McCormick. She was a teenage dental hygienist. That sounds like a They Might Be Giant song. She was a... Teenage dental hygienist. (laughs) So he's pretending to be a super, or he actually is the acting super. He's pretty much playing. Daddy's like, okay, go run. Yeah, go go fuck off. Go look over (laughs) some of my buildings. Yeah. You're going to have the skeleton key. He's obsessed with this girl. He's smitten. They go out on a couple of dates, and then he's like, why don't you come with me to Vermont, and we can run a health food store together. Mm. And she's like, okay. That has got to be the easiest bait to be able to get a date. Oh, I'm, I, I own the building. You can just come and live with me happily ever after. But also, Any girl would be like, yeah. And to be so rich that on a whim you can just open a health food store <laughs> in Vermont. That sounds like a quaint paradise. Right, it is. 
Like, it doesn't even matter if anyone ever buys anything. Right. It doesn't. That's the thing. He just wanted to be, you know, out in the wilderness with his wife or his girlfriend. 1973. The father goes up to Vermont and he's like, what do you think you guys are doing up here? Get back to New York. I need you. I need help with the family business. And so Robert's like, okay. Ends up taking Kathy back with him. And then they get married. It's very nice. Yeah. It's so nice. He's 30 years old. She is 19. Oof. And they've been together for two years. So he was 28 when she was 17. Yikes. Yeah. Why don't we have a seat? <laughs> <laughs> By 1980, seven years later, the marriage is just horrible. They're fighting all the time. Kathy is telling friends and family that uh, he's hitting her. He's controlling her. Um, he made her have an abortion. She considers divorce, but ultimately she decides against it because she signed a prenup. It wasn't there an ironclad clause yeah. that said she wouldn't get any money through a divorce? Yeah. Because technically he didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. He was on some kind of trust fund arrangement yeah and it should be pointed out that she does not come from money no not at all so that makes it even worse for her mm -hmm. because she's like you said he's older and not only that but obscenely rich he has all the control in the relationship. all the power all the power fight the power yeah she is very much not gonna see a dime if she gets divorced from him so she's just like you know what i'll suck it up i'll stay with him and then i'll just uh have my relationships on the side. So they both start messing around on each other. He ends up getting with Prudence Farrow, the sister of Alejandro's favorite human being on earth, Mia Farrow. Oh. And who happens to be the uh, inspiration for the famous Beatles song, Dear Prudence. Dear Prudence. Yep. Who gets with her? Robert Durst. He's having yeah, an affair with I, her. I'm not surprised. <laughs> the Farrows. They seem like they have a type. <laughs> hey. Older, rich Jewish guys in New York City. Oh, well, when you put it like that. <laughs> who do bad things to people. <laughs> <laughs> At least Woody had talent. Oh, my God. <laughs> do bad things to people. Yeah, all bad things. The Curse of the Jade Scorpion <laughs> wasn't that bad, Kyle. Come on. He gave us Match Point and Midnight in Paris after that. Sure. So Prudence actually also lives in a Durst family-owned building. So he's just banging everyone that has a lease with his dad. Wow. <laughs> 1982, Robert Durst's wife, Kathy, ends up going to the hospital because she was punched in the face many times and had bruises all over her oh, face. Oh, God. So she's starting to document. And I think that's a smart thing to do. I don't know about the... The prenup that they had, but I think it's smart to be able to document abuse. Of course. For, and for every, many reasons, yeah. but this being one of them. Every situation is yeah. very important. Yes, if you're being abused, go to the hospital, document everything. Tell the police, even if they don't listen to you. Uh, but I think her friends were telling her, like, go to the hospital if something happens. Go to the police if something happens. You'll be protected, and you might be able to get out of that stupid prenup, and you'll be able mm -hmm. to get away from this guy with some change in your pocket, which would be, you know, optimal. And especially nowadays, I don't think the prenup would go very far in a court of law when they see the monster she was dealing with. Yeah, exactly. They would make sure that she's taken care of. Yeah. Again, just a month later, 1982, uh, this is actually January 31st. Kathy Durst went to a party at the home of uh, her friend Gilbert. Godfried. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you again, Kathy. Kathy! <laughs> <laughs> I'm molten. Do you have half whack? <laughs> so on January 31st, 1982, less than a month later, Kathy Durst goes to a party at her friend Gilbert and Jamie's house in Connecticut. She ends up leaving early. She's freaked out. Uh, Robert Durst starts calling the house and being like, you get home right now. And she was there. She usually would always come in like a nice dress, look very, you know, well done or be done up. Mm -hmm. And her friends noticed like she was just there in sweatpants. She was, you know, she just looked disheveled and something was wrong. But they weren't able to talk to her for too long because she was only there for a little bit and then gets a call from Robert and then has to go. Kathy before leaving, says, if something happens to me, check it out. I'm afraid of what Bobby will do. She said that to people at the party? Yeah. 
And that's the last time anyone saw her alive. Mm. So in this time, Kathy's missing. Um, her friends don't know what to do. They're, they're trying to get in touch with her. They can't. Robert goes, well, well I, I put her on a train back to New York. So Because she was staying at the family cottage in Salem, Salem, New York, which was close to Connecticut. She ended up going back there. They have a fight. And then all of a sudden, Robert just goes, well, you know, I put her on a train and she went back to New York City and I gave her a call. The reason the police don't really freak out about it is because they said that they confirmed that she actually did call in days later saying, I don't feel good. I'm not coming in today. So it was always a missing persons report. And he didn't report her missing for six days. So February 5th, 1982, Durst finally reports Kathy missing. And he tells them the same thing I just said. He said that Kathy came to the couple's South Salem cottage the night of the 31st. Then after a big fight, she wanted to go back to the city. So he says he dropped her at the Metro North Station. And then she called him when she got home. So he's confirming that, oh, she made it home, even though he's the only one that is the witness to this. Yeah. And he gets lucky. His story is confirmed from a doorman at their building who says that he saw her from the back like a half block away. <laughs> and so... Huh. They're like, oh, okay, perfect. That could have been someone else, though. Could have easily been someone else in New York City. New York City! <laughs> you can see anyone from the back and be like, oh, yeah, that's that's my buddy right there. That's someone I know. The movie implies that it could have been Susan Berman in a Ooh. wig, wearing a blonde wig, his friend that he met in college. Yeah. That would be a quick turnaround from L.A. to New York City. Well, or it could have been... Someone else he mm. hired to do that. Yeah. The assistant dean of her medical school said that he spoke to Kathy personally on the phone, and she called in sick, saying, I'm not going to be able to make it. Hmm. So he's getting these huge breaks. Yeah. And the police are just like, okay, she's a missing person. In spring of 1982, her friends are freaking out. They're like, she wouldn't have just gone missing. The last time we saw her, she said, if anything happens to me, make sure Bobby gets fucking locked up. Yeah. They go to their Westchester home and discover Kathy's mail is in the trash, like completely unopened. He's not worried about it at all. He's just throwing all her shit away. They go to the police. The police admit that they have their own suspicions, but there's really nothing they can do. The doorman admits that he only saw Kathy from behind, like we said, and from like a half block away. Absolutely ridiculous. So yeah. now everyone's kind of backing off being like, whoa, whoa, wait a second here. There's something going on. But there's... No evidence that a murder or anything took place. So they keep it open as a missing person uh, case. Nothing. There's no piece of clothing ripped off. There's no mm -mm. hair follicle, blood. I'm sure there is, but at that time, it's 1982. There's no DNA testing really happening. That really didn't start coming up until around 94 when O.J. Simpson went to trial. And even then, it was like blood types. It wasn't even real like DNA. And with all his money... Who knows who he could have hired to take care of this? Well, he actually did hire someone. His friend, Susan Berman, he appoints her as his unofficial spokesperson. She is a wild person. She is the daughter of a famous Las Vegas gangster and, you know, has grown up around some shady people. So Durst fits right into that profile. Yeah. Like they, they can relate to each other in a lot of ways, I'm sure, because <laughs> his dad probably had the personality traits of a gangster at times. Yeah, Being I mean, a, you kind of have to. Yeah, real estate tycoon. Yeah. 1988, Robert Durst finds a very ambitious woman, Deborah Lee Sheraton, who ends up becoming his wife. She's a New York City real estate broker. He convinced another woman to marry him. Another good-looking woman, too, yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. He's got all these ride-or-die bitches around him. Money does talk. <laughs> It goes a long way. It goes a very long way, apparently. Two years later, he sells the South Salem Cottage and secretly divorces his wife so that he can start his life with Deborah Lee, officially. When he divorces Kathy, they ask him the reason, and he, uh, <laughs> I mean, you can't write, like, irreconcilable differences. He just wrote that she abandoned the marriage. So this guy has the nerve to kill somebody, <laughs> hide their body, never tell anybody where she is, and then say, she left me. That's one way to frame it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's official. Robert has been passed over 
for receiving the company from, from his father. Aww. It is the year of OJ killing somebody and Robert Durst also, you know, having his transgressions against his family. So apparently Brendan Schaub isn't the first person or the last person to uh, get in trouble about this, but they said that <laughs> the father just couldn't stand Robert in the first place, but he had these disgusting habits where he would uh, piss in his uncle's trash can instead of going to the bathroom. So <laughs> they were like, what the fuck are you doing? And like, this is in the office. Oh my God. Yeah. So <laughs> he ends up freaking out, telling everybody to fuck off, and then travels around the country. Even with Deborah Lee now, he, he's completely left her and he just travels around the country by himself. And he keeps in touch with her every once in a while. He stays, he has an appointment. Which she's probably happy with. Yeah, why not? Yeah. She gets to live the life and doesn't have to deal with him on a d uh, daily basis. Best of both worlds. In 1999, the police receive a bad tip about the location of Kathy's body. They reopen the Kathy Durst case, and this time they list it as a possible homicide. They search the old cottage and the nearby lake. They look around it. They, you know, digging up holes. Can't find her anywhere. August 2000, Susan Berman is struggling in L.A. by herself. So she writes Robert asking if she can get some cashola. Which he has plenty of. Yeah, he has plenty of, and she has always supported him. So she's like, hey. She was not only a great friend, but she was his spokesperson. Yes. And she might have even acted as a body double for his wife. That would be absolutely insane if she really did that. So he owes her. Yeah. So she's like, yeah, can you please repay my loyalty so I can pay some bills over here? He sends her $50,000. At this same time, the NYPD reach out to Susan, who is living in L.A., about the newly reopened Kathy Durst case. And she tells him, like, hey, the NYPD is coming snooping around. I don't know what to do. Can you please help me out with some cash? So now she may have just been being a good friend and saying, you know, heads up, they're looking again. Or he could have taken that as a threat. Being like, pay me this money or else I'll tell the NYPD who just happened to be started coming around asking some questions. She ends up dead this year in 2000. Dead? Like she had a natural causes? She had a heart attack? Uh, she had a hole in the head. Ooh. An extra one. Don't you hate when that happens? Yeah. I need an extra hole in my head like I need an extra hole in my head. <laughs> she was killed execution style with a gun. <sighs> back of her head there's no signs of forced entry all her valuables were still around the only piece of evidence that they found was this letter that only the killer could send and it was sent to the beverly hills police department saying cadaver the theory is that he didn't want her just in her house rotting away because he actually did care about her but he couldn't have her rat on him and have him go to prison for the rest of his life. So he killed her without her knowing, but shot to the back of the head, and then wanted to make sure her body was taken care of. So oh, that's sweet of him. It's very sweet. <laughs> Would you do the same for me? Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. In the letter addressed to Beverly Hills Police, he spells Beverly with an E-Y at the end, which nobody does. So he's an idiot. Yes. Or was that on purpose somehow? Ben? No, I don't think it was on purpose. I think that's how he thought it, Beverly was spelled because we go back to the Jinx, which is the HBO series about Robert Durst. It's the docuseries that, you know, Andrew Jarecki, who invented movie phone back in the day. Hello and welcome, welcome to, to movie, movie phone. phone. If you know the name of the movie you'd like to see, press one. To select from a list of current movies, press two. Sells it for $400 million. Goes on to make some documentaries. He also made uh, a very well done film called All Good Things, which we kind of mentioned. And it's about Robert Durst. And Robert Durst is played by Ryan Gosling. And Kathy is played by Kirsten Dunst. It's and, a very well made movie. Yeah. Very they use fictionalized names, but everything else is the same. Yeah. the What's the same, too, is All Good Things is the name of the health food store. Yes. In real life and in the movie. Yeah. So Robert sees this movie in 2010, is absolutely enamored with it. He's like, this is my favorite movie. He said he cried three times watching it. Yeah, one for every person he killed. And who wouldn't like to see a movie where Ryan Gosling plays but, you? Yeah, when you're <laughs> this little troll. Yeah, he looks like a rat. <laughs> yeah. He looks like Splinter if Splinter shaved. Yeah. 
<laughs> so he's enamored with this movie. He tells Jarecki, you did a fantastic job. I loved it. Cried a million times. I will now give you unfettered access to myself and all of my files in my diaries. And it's probably that sociopath, narcissist Completely. Thing where he wants his story told. Yeah, again and again. He wants more attention. Yeah. So fast forward to the season finale of The Jinx. If you haven't seen it, it's been around f- since 2015. So spoiler alert, but it's also on you. Uh, he ends up getting a letter from one, in- one of Susan Berman's friends who has her possessions. And there was a letter from Robert Durst written in the same actual handwriting that said Beverly Hills with the EY. And it was addressed to Susan from Robert. And so Jarecki goes, what's up with these two in the season finale? And he's like, oh, uh, he tenses up. He freezes up. He doesn't know what to say. He's like, well, I wrote one of them, but not the other. That's definitely not my handwriting, even though they're the same exact thing. Robert before then had said, you know, it's incredible. You have this one one uh, letter here that only the killer could write. And it says cadaver and it says it in his fucking handwriting. And then that's when he brings out the EYs on Beverly Hills. And he is shocked. He's like, I got to go to the bathroom. And this is what he says in the bathroom. Or maybe this is the bathroom. Yeah, that's. You're all right. This is the bathroom. I'm having difficulty with the question. Kill them all. Of course. He's freaking out. He's like, You're having difficulties with the question. You killed them all, of course. Jarecki is working with the police while he's doing these interviews. And he's like, I actually think I have evidence now. He's going to the NYPD showing them this audio. Being like, he definitely just admitted to killing everybody that (laughs) he's been accused of killing. Yeah, and what's incredible about it is the fact that that letter even surfaced that shows Beverly Hills written the same way, spelled wrong the same way, clearly written by the same person. Yeah. That emerges while this documentary series is airing, or being made, rather. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, then all that develops while the docuseries is airing. Yeah. So the NYPD takes this, and they're like, this is enough to move forward with. The day before the Jinx finale comes on, and people actually hear that audio, Robert Durst is arrested in New Orleans, because he's on the run with a mask on and 80 grand in his pocket, ready to go. (laughs) You think, holy shit, great job. Now he's going to go on trial for the murder of his friend Susan Berman, which he definitely committed, and that's it. The jinx is over. All of a sudden, last week, out of nowhere, they put up a billboard. They start airing commercials online about the jinx season two, now coming this weekend. And I was like, what? And you don't know where it's going to start or what is going to happen and until you watch the first episode, which is that's the only thing that's aired so far. And they jump right in with Jarecki hosting a viewing party for prosecutors who have prosecuted him, um, police officers that arrested him, family members of victims that he's killed. And they're all in the same room together. And here's a clip. Everybody here is laughing. The, it's such a good time because he's such an idiot and saying dumb shit. And yeah. Ha, 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 isn't this funny? There's a look of concern on some people's faces, but for the most part, people are just enjoying this. This is fun and ha, ha, ha. And the mood very quickly changes. And as the episode progresses, the room got quieter and quieter. So, um, so obviously I want to ask you about the cadaver note, the famous cadaver note. Can you read me the spelling of Beverly Hills? Beverly Hills Police, 1527 Benedict Canyon, cadaver. <laughs> so you wrote one of these, but you didn't write the other one. I wrote this one, but I did not write the cadaver one. I didn't write that one. Can you tell me which one you didn't write? No. Bingo. I am going to go use the restroom, which is right here. Or maybe this is the bathroom. Yeah, that's... You're all right. This is the bathroom. You're right. (laughs) Oh, you're right. Yeah, the room with the toilet in it, I guess, is the bathroom. (laughs) He's so nervous. And then at this point, Tex says that he doesn't realize his mic is still on. There it is. You're caught. He says, there it is. You're caught. 
the whole room freaks out because uh-huh. they think that's the whole world freaked out. But what's amazing about this viewing party is that they got together and recorded this so you can see all these people's reactions in real time to the moment we were all shocked by. A room of people that have been trying to get him to fucking admit it forever finally hears it straight from the horse's mouth. There it is. Your court. Utter shock. So when he says killed them all, uh, we've only talked about two people so far. There was a third person. First one, his first wife, Kathy, went missing. We don't know where she ended up, but clearly he had something to do with her disappearance Uh, definitely guilty of not being honest about what happened to her yeah then we have his best friend susan berman who either he thought she was a threat because she was actually threatening him and blackmailing him saying you know the nypd's coming it'd be a shame if they found out what really happened you should send me some money or she actually really needed money and was trying to be a good friend by warning him either way he couldn't have it he saw her as a threat took her out and then While he's on the run, just a year after he kills Susan Berman, he's just living in Galveston, Texas, by himself, uh, dressed as a woman, a mute woman, so he didn't have to use his voice. And he would just come and go as he pleased, and nobody really knew that he wasn't a woman there. Yeah, because he kept to himself. Yeah, until he couldn't anymore. And so in September of 2001, you know, the towers just fell. They did. Two weeks later, a family is fishing in Galveston, Texas, and they find a dismembered body floating right off the beach. Mm. Police are looking everywhere through the bay. They find many severed body parts. This guy was just ripped into shreds, but they said whoever did it was very calculated. They knew exactly what they were doing. The cuts were perfect. It was like a butcher knowing how to like saw through the bone and saw through all the uh, joints and whatnot. Yeah. Robert Durst is so dumb that he ended up wrapping the body parts in a garbage bag. But before that, he wrapped them up in newspaper. And when they took the newspaper apart, they saw that it was addressed to Robert Durst. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) He really is dumb. Yeah. With the writing of those notes. Yep. And being involved in the jinx where it's his idea. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> he couldn't just live and let live, or live and let die in his case. Yeah. And enjoy the fact that he got away with it. He was still rich. He's just such a fucking narcissistic moron. Yeah. But he gets away with everything. Until he didn't. Yeah. So in October of 2001... Police go and they search the boarding house that Robert was living in with this man, Morris Black, who they find out that's who was killed. They break down the door with a search warrant and they find blood all over Morris's room. And then they find a trail of blood leading out of the apartment. Directly to Robert Durst's Robert Durst wig. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up finding a bloody knife and a bloody pair of men's boots. And he's like, that can't be mine. I'm a woman. And then they realize that the woman who's living downstairs is actually Robert Durst, who, you know, has had some troubles. So they put out a warrant for his arrest. They end up finding him at a random hotel under the name that he was staying in. It was uh, Jim Truss, (laughs) (laughs) which is a high school classmate of his. Ah. Yeah. A search of his car revealed the bow saw that was used to cut Morris Black up. (sighs) Ugh. As well as a gun. So he's caught red-handed. Literally. Red saw head. <laughs> um, they found the gun, too, which is crazy because they found every piece of... Wait, the Susan Berman gun? No. Oh. They just found a gun. Oh, okay. So they find every piece of Morris's body except for his head. And so it makes sense that they would find a gun and a saw when they go to search Robert's car because it is alleged that he shot 
Morris in the head and then hid his head <laughs> um, so that they couldn't tell that he actually killed him execution style. So that he could claim self-defense. Yes, exactly. He ends up posting a $300,000 bail and then goes on the run. He then, after he's arrested for the murder, he, I don't know why they gave him bail, but they did. And he pays it, three hundred grand. then he, goes on the run. I hate when they give bail to rich people. Yeah, because they can actually post it. And then he t- assumes Morris Black's identity and rents a car in Mobile, Alabama as Morris Black. Yet another example <laughs> of him being extremely stupid. Yeah. And so two weeks after that, he's still on the run. They can't find him anywhere. A judge officially declares Kathy Durst dead. Um. The $60,000 that Robert inherits is placed in escrow um, until the investigation into her death. and Morris Inherits? What does that mean? She had sixty grand, And he might account. get her money? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Ugh, <that> is... <laughs> wow. And yeah, that's, you know, over a decade after she's dead. And she wasn't declared dead until then. November 2001. <sighs> yeah. Jeez. November 30th, 2001, there's a call sent to the police in Pennsylvania that a man is trying to shoplift a sandwich. And (laughs) (laughs) they arrest this guy, Morris Black, who turns out to be dead in Galveston, Texas. They realize they have a different guy and quickly find out that it's Robert Durst. (laughs) We have a code, blue cheese. (laughs) Code Swiss, Code Swiss. <laughs> he's running off with a panini. But yeah, he's shoplifting sandwiches. He's going, he got kicked out of a pharmacy for pissing on candy in the candy aisle. Like he's just doing so weird shit. That was his thing to piss on things. Yeah, I guess he's tagging and marking his territory like a house cat. <laughs> <laughs> Needs so, to be put down. Yeah, he definitely <laughs> does. So he's gotten away with murder every step of the way, mm-hmm. literally. September 2003, Durst finally goes on trial for the death of Morris Black. He starts saying, hey, I killed him in self-defense because he came after me with a gun. And he did, because there's no way of not admitting it, he said he dismembered him and cut him up and threw him in the ocean. He said he was scared and didn't know what to do. At this time, he gives Sharaton, his second wife, who he's just like not been in contact with, he gives her power of attorney. So she's living the life. She doesn't have to deal with this guy. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> she gets power of attorney for one of the richest people. Well, she doesn't <laughs> care if he lives or dies. Fuck no. She's probably like, please, God, yes, get arrested. Fucking go to jail forever. And then I'm set. November 11th, 2003. Would you believe me if I told you Durst is found not guilty of the murder of Morris Black? Whenever I hear that, I still can't believe it. It's insane. Yeah. When he admitted to doing it, too, eventually. Yeah. Saying it was Mm self-defense. But there's no way that was self-defense. No. And it's just so convenient that they can't find the head, which has a hole in the back of it, (laughs) because that's what he does to people. Yeah. All good things implies that Morris Black may have been hired to kill Susan Berman. Which I don't think that's the case at all. He's played by Philip Baker Hall in the movie. Yeah, that was so crazy. It's awesome. <laughs> we got a deal. Yeah, they meet each other in, in the building, and then they start smoking weed together. Yeah. And Ryan Gosling is dressed as the woman. Mm-hmm. And then while they're smoking weed, Morris is like, what are you, some kind of weirdo? Yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> so at this time, too, Durst ends up having to plead guilty because he had another case um, about tampering with evidence and jumping bail. He's found guilty because he pleads guilty, sentenced to five years, but then gets credit for the time served. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. In December of 2005, Durst is paroled and is told to stay near his house. Like, don't fucking go anywhere. You are not allowed to travel. We need to keep you where we can find you. Yeah. He fucks off and goes back to the boarding house that he killed Morris Black at and just driving by it. And he he had actually spotted by the judge who presided over his trial out and about. And then he gets thrown in jail for a little bit for violating his parole. But good old Dursty. Yeah. uh, He he thinks that he can do whatever he wants. Comes out on top again. February of 2006, he's throwing a temper tantrum being like, I was never paid out my share of I I want to get out of the Durst organization. 
They give him $65 million to fuck off. Unreal. Mm-hmm. I'm, I mean, a man like that, yeah. a danger to society, yeah. suddenly gets rewarded with $65 million mm-hmm. when he should be rotting in jail at that point. Yeah. And so he ends up being released from prison again in 2006. 2010, like we said, is when Andrew Jarecki released All Good Things that is based on his life with mm-hmm. fake names. And he loved it. <laughs> Parts made me cry. And against the advice of his own lawyer, contacts Jarecki to say, would you like to make a documentary about me? We have a clip of Jarecki talking about that on Charlie Rose, yeah. actually. Well, you know, people sometimes say when we, we talk about what we're working on, they say, you know, does, does Bob know what you're doing? Because they know we've been working on this for years. Yeah. And, and I always say, does he know what we're doing? It was his idea. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you think about it, Bob saw our film about him and reached out to me and said, this I would the, like this, to talk. This is the, the motion picture film. Right. Or so what, saw, I would yeah, Charlie, saw people would film. say saw Ryan Gosling. That's what a movie is, Charlie. And thought yeah. that we had the painted a, picture a film. relatively sympathetic portrait of him, at least a fair portrait of him. And he called and said, look, nobody's ever really understood me before. I've seen the movie. I cried three times. Um, it's an emotional movie. I would like to talk more to you. And we got back. We got together with him and his lawyer. It's been a good day for you. It was fascinating. I mean, I called Mark and I said, hey. guess who I just got a phone call from. Um, but the first meeting was very interesting with his lawyer because we got together here in New York. And I had met with a lawyer a couple of times and with Bob a few times. And the lawyer sat down and said, Bob, you've asked me to look at what Andrew wants to do and to, 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 to think about what I think about it. I know what you've considered sitting down, doing an interview about your life, kind of no holds barred. And I've come to the conclusion, I think this is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and like usual with Robert Durst, he did not care. Yeah. And went forward anyway. Yeah. And during this time, Durst has the most money he's ever had at one time, $65 million. He's living on this high, gotten away with murder multiple times now. And now he wants to be famous, famous. Yes. Now he's going swinging for the fences. He wants to be a part of the cultural zeitgeist, which... For better or worse, he does. Certainly. During this time, he feels untouchable. So he actually goes and violates a restraining order that his brother Douglas had placed upon him. Ends up getting arrested. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Doug. (laughs) While they're filming the Jinx, which they kind of talk about in the the first season. Yeah. The Jinx is a documentary where it's not just static talking head interviews it's amazing because things are actually happening in it day in the life they would follow him around yeah and then (laughs) afterwards obviously it affected his whole (laughs) criminal trial yeah 2014 june 12th 2014 a day that is living in infamy the oj simpson uh, that's the 20th anniversary of the O.J. Simpson, uh, Nicole Brown, Ron Goldman murders. Yeah, and we're coming up on the 30th this year. That is, yes, and we will have a live in-theater experience for the 30th anniversary. And it's a shame no one ever threw a mic on O.J. while he took a piss. Yeah, no shit. So June 12, 2014, 20 years to the day of the O.J. Simpson murders, uh, the J- Jinx filmmakers discover that they have the audio confession so it was a while after they recorded mm-hmm. that. So they didn't even know that they had it. That's insane. Wow. They send it to police, and then the LAPD reopens the investigation into his best friend, Susan Berman's murder. So that really was a coincidence that they were finally able to arrest him on that night they arrested him? When police finally had enough evidence and had the go-ahead to make the arrest? Yeah. Yeah. That happened to be the same weekend that the finale of the Jinx was airing. I think they were doing it on purpose to keep him around. Yeah. So he could see. So it was on purpose. I think so. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's ever been confirmed that it was on purpose, but I think it was. Because that was a part I was always confused by when hearing about that for the first time. Because he was arrested the same weekend the finale aired. Couldn't have been better for Jurek right. and <laughs> HBO. <laughs> and couldn't have been worse for Durst. Yeah. Uh, 2014, July, Durst, like I said, turned himself in after taking a piss on a candy rack at a Houston CVS. (laughs) There he is pissing again. (laughs) Pissing his life away. away. 
The LAPD reexamines the cadaver letter and officially conclude that Durst is the author. Wow. And then the fifth episode of The Jinx airs. The envelope uh, envelope is shown to everybody, and Durst goes on the lamb again. <laughs> he's on the lamb all the time. That, <laughs> he's on the lamb more than he's home. He lives on the lamb. Yeah. <laughs> or a black sheep. He's more of a lamb guy. A Los Angeles judge then signs a warrant to get Robert taken care of and arrested in L.A. And so you think it's all local stuff happening in New York City and L.A., but the FBI gets involved, and they're the ones that arrest him in New Orleans, where he is trying to escape to Cuba, baby. Yeah. <laughs> he's wearing a mask. He's got $80,000. And that's at the Marriott Hotel, correct? Yes. Yeah, which you said you stayed at, right? Yeah. That's crazy. I'm proud. <laughs> I spent almost a week there. Yeah. I didn't know that was the site where he was arrested, though. Wow. Yeah. He was there trying to take off. I feel like it's such a weird city to go to, like, lay low. It's such a party city. Yeah, but the thing is, you can blend in there. I guess, especially if you're an old white guy just like... Wearing a rubber mask. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's with that elderly Michael Myers motherfucker over there? <laughs> eh, whatever. Let's go join the parade. Yeah. Jinx season one wraps up. He's arrested, goes on trial, and you think that's where the story ends. Boom, boom, bang. But that's where it's just beginning, especially for the Jinx season two, which just aired. And that is going to be covering the arrest and prosecution and eventual death of Robert Durst. But luckily, he was tried before his death. Mm -hmm. That's very cool, actually. Yeah. Here's a clip of him during his prosecution for the murder of Susan Berman. There were certain things that I would lie about. Certain very important things. If his voice sounds a little different to you, it's because, um, A, he's getting older and more frail, but he's also been receiving treatment for bladder cancer, so he's very uh, frail. Because uh, some people in the comments were saying that, oh, yeah, another guilty guy acting feeble because Harvey Weinstein pulled that trick. Which Harvey Weinstein's rape conviction just got overturned today, right, by the way. it did. That's crazy. We'll more on that, yeah, yeah, to come. yeah. So, yeah, people do think that he was faking. He might be playing it up a little bit, but he was v extremely sick. He looked like he was dead. Yeah. He looked like he had a run, with, run in with him. Was, <laughs> yeah. They, was... Even the crib keeper is going, whoa, <laughs> try some sun lotion. Why don't you lay down? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard of an avocado mask? <laughs> My God, man. <laughs> There are certain things that I would lie about. Certain very important things. So maybe another way to say it, Mr. Durst, is would you agree that the question of did you kill Susan Berman is the most important question in this trial? I would agree with that. And you've also just agreed that you would lie about that. Correct. And you've also <laughs> just agreed that, in fact, if you had killed her, you wouldn't tell us, correct? Correct. A hypothetical, did you kill Susan Berman? It's strictly a hypothetical. Um, no, it's not. It is not a hypothetical. What's with asking? The, those killers love those the hypotheticals because it allows them to live in their fantasy that they didn't do it. If I was a killer, <laughs> I would have done it like this. <laughs> He sounds like the grandpa on South Park. Who's kill trying, me, Billy! Yeah, kill me. <laughs> I keep waiting for him to say that. Would someone please kill me? Judge Janine, please. I hate Trump. I did not kill Susan Berman. I did all. not kill her. Did you kill Susan Berman? It's strictly a hypothetical. I did not kill Susan Berman, but if I had, I would lie about it. So, for the <laughs> you know, at least he's uh, yeah. honest about being a liar. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he lies about being honest. <laughs> yeah, uh, the jury wasn't buying that bullshit this time, and luckily, Robert Durst was found guilty of the murder of Susan Berman. Thank God. Sentenced to life in prison without parole. At the time, he had very little life left. So, I mean, life could have been a week. It could have been maybe a couple of years. 
But on January 10th, 2022, he was taken out by bladder cancer at San Joaquin General Hospital in French Camp, California. Thank you, bladder cancer. <laughs> yeah. You know, we were talking about this during the OJ thing. Sometimes cancer gets it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it looks like, oh, that's just north of Modesto near San Jose. It's like the Bay Area, Santa Rosa. So that is a five and a half hour drive from us right now. Okay, so we'll add it to our extended tour. Yeah, if you want to come on the Death and Entertainment Hollywood walking tour, we can uh, send you up in a cab <laughs> <laughs> six hours away on your own dime. We'll send you on a bus like Kathleen Durst. Yeah. Except you're going to survive that ride. I last saw them on the train. <laughs> Ugh, what a monster, and to take out his first wife and then his best friend in the world. Yeah. And then another friend. He was friends with Morris. Yeah. I mean, it's annoying, too, that, you know, obviously cancer can be painful and all that stuff, but it was almost um, too kind of a death for him. Yeah. He should have had more time in prison. Absolutely. To really be miserable, but he probably would have ended up loving it. There probably would have been people who were nice to him and doing favors for him, just like everybody was doing on the outside. Oh, and that brings us to... Final Thoughts. Well, R.I.P. Kathleen McCormick, his first wife, R.I.P. Susan Berman, and R.I.P. Morris Black. Like we were saying, I think cancer was too kind of a death for him, especially after only being in prison for that little amount of time. He should have had more time to think about it and, uh, you know, been miserable in jail. But like I said earlier, I think it's great that he had to pay for his crimes before he died. Yeah. So he died in jail knowing that he was found guilty. Yeah, that people weren't believing his bullshit anymore. His yeah. luck had run out. And money. What did money get him in those final years? Yeah, he couldn't uh, get a dream team together to get him off. <laughs> no. It was the same lawyer that he had in Galveston, Texas, with Morris Black that came and um, uh, helped him out in this trial, and it just did not work. And I think he knew it wasn't going to work, and he was getting his last paycheck from Robert ever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and you know what I just thought of? It was almost like an interesting cosmic happening that he would die of bladder cancer when he was so obsessed with pissing over everything. Boom. And he was caught in the bathroom <laughs> confessing to himself on a mic. Literally caught with his pants down. <laughs> yeah. And then he dies of bladder cancer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and actually, Kyle, there's one final clip that I found that you might find interesting. In that bathroom confession, yeah. they had to edit it for time. Okay. But there was actually more audio from that hot mic in wow. the bathroom. Wow. Let's hear it. Or maybe this is the bathroom. Yeah, that's... You're all right. This is the bathroom. Yeah. I'm having difficulty with the question. Kill them all. Of course. So nice work, Alejandro. <laughs> so disturbing, isn't that? Very. Eerie. Yeah. <laughs> and you can just hear the relief. Yeah. After he confessed. And he got it all out. <laughs> <laughs> but did he get it all out? Because he thinks he's caught on all three murders that he's accused of, right? But would you believe me, Alejandro, that there may be upwards of 10 more victims? What? Yes. And we will hear about that next time we talk about Robert Durst. I can't wait. And until then, don't go dying on us. Bye. You have just heard... A true Hollywood murder mystery. I have never seen anything like this before. The movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it. A place that manufactures nightmares. Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. Good night. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon.